his nickname, and James and John were the son sons of thunder. So you can just imagine them a fisherman, and if they didn't be their next tiny, then Dad was going to give them a right gossip. And uh, James sort of took it on the chin, uh, and uh, was one of the uh, early leaders within the church. And John was someone who felt uh, kind of misunderstood until he came across Jesus, who kind of understood he was a sensitive man, an artistic man. So when it comes to the Gospels, Mark is the shortest, the Daily Mail, a lot more truth incidentally than the Daily Mail. Uh, I've got journalists who listen to that. Uh, but uh, Luke said, ah, but Mark, you left out a little chunk, which was a kind of European dimension, you might say, uh, thinking much more widely about the implications of the Gospel, and then Acts was his second book, uh, about how that Gospel actually went all the way through the Roman Empire and so on. Uh, Matthew said, hang on a minute, we're not sure you're right, because actually this is very much our home story, and he gives the Jewish flavour of that, so he gives us the genealogy of Jesus, and uh, how he really fit it into the picture and so on. Uh, and so we've got very different flavours. Uh, the core, though, is basically Mark's brief uh, oracle of uh, Jesus. John, on the other hand, he is an extraordinary character, because he has the confidence to say, in his gospel, I'm going to tell you the truth, and here you can see the emphasis, actually, Jesus didn't say that, but he did say this, he's focusing on the truth constantly, and he's focusing on Christ, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But John had the confidence to collect together the I am sayings, to collect together the miracles. So rather than just telling us the story all the way through, he actually interpreted and shaped and helped to explain what that story meant. There is a debate, as you know, about how true or not the crown, the latest version, is. Is it just drama with a loose connection to truth, or is it actually what really happened? And of course, an awful lot of people who don't know and weren't around when the Diana thing was going on, for instance, they will see that Netflix is right, because that's the only version we've got. John was not like that. He was not saying, I'm going to give you my version of what took place. Constantly, he was saying, I'm going to talk about what is true. I'm going to make sure that the truth is the gearbox of everything I tell you. So he had the confidence to say, I know it's true, but not to do it in a mechanical way, but then to explain, here's the flavour. And that is a remarkable confidence to have that kind of uh, way of writing. We don't know whether any written other material, because of course writing was something fairly technical in those days anyway. So he gives us the fourth gospel, which is a lovely kind of painting of gospel. And it works in lots of different ways. So for instance, I remember one person, he was a parson actually, and uh, he wanted to give a talk quite understandably for his father, and he had five very closely typed pages of all the accurate information. So it was all true about what his father did. The time he was born, the date, uh, all kind of stuff, but it was completely flat because it was just information. He didn't dig. And I found it quite difficult because as a fellow parson, I thought, A, this is very long, and B, this isn't the chap we know. This is a load of facts about the chap we know, but it's not the fellow we know. And John had the gospel, uh, the gospel uh, dynamic in terms of good news, telling God news, that's what the gospel is, to say, I'm going to give you a sketch of who Jesus really is. We're entering a lovely time now, and uh, we did some research over the day in the uh, course that I'm running, the lay worship leaders course, about uh, what the different festivals meant. And uh, in some cases, uh, Mothering Sunday really stretches where people are itching. It means a huge amount. In a different village, it might go down like a lead blue. It depends on the circumstances. Because our villages are different. Of course they are. But what we all agree is that epiphany really doesn't mean anything. The wise men over there at the back, uh, they're on the Christmas card, so in practice people have imported the wise men story into the Christmas tide story. And the church, oh no, you can't talk about that till it's epiphany. And we are chopping things sometimes into lots of little bits. So we agree that the one festival that we didn't mean in any is Epiphany. But Epiphany is an amazing occasion, and I want to work at it together 
to have two strands. One is certainty. John knew what certainty was. He based things on the truth. He was not going to make up the story. He knew what certainty was. But then he gave us surprise and twists. So put yourself in Jesus' shoes. You know because the Holy Spirit has come upon you after 30 years, and you've been working as a carpenter for 25 of those years probably, because there's a little lag in the big cleaning up the workshop for Joseph and so on. At last, you can get on with your ministry. So how's it going to happen? You're the Son of God, you are aware where you came from, you've grown, you have to grow into that understanding. The time you had in the temple was really important because you suddenly thought, I feel this temple has got a real connection to my, my father. I know Joseph well, but actually there's something else going on here. By the time you came to 30, you're quite settled in terms of who you are. The surprise is you suddenly get an elbow from Mummy, Mary, Jesus, they run out of wine. Your first miracle. So you'd think that he would have got it all organised, but God the Holy Spirit took Mary's elbow to elbow Jesus into his ministry. And there are times when you and I might feel quite different about something, and we'll suddenly find ourselves elbowed into a situation where we don't necessarily feel particularly comfortable, where actually it's really important we say something, or it's really important we don't say anything. Because sometimes people say too much, sometimes they don't say what they ought to say. But God's Spirit can use our neighbours and elbow and all sorts of things to actually get us to the right place at the right time to be part of his gospel. Of course that speaks as if we're exporting the gospel. No, we need to respond to that gospel as well. So it may be that you and I feel completely flat I had a, 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 a time when, uh, at the peak of uh, when the crematorium was running every half an hour, and we had to have a quarter of an hour to get in and out and clean the surfaces in between. So we just had a quarter of an hour to give thanks to God for the lives of different people. And I went around once and then went around again. I gave James on the door a while ago. I said, It's not you, James, but between two and three, I need to get my blood sugar up. And then went round. And after that, I was surprised by a conversation with a lovely chap. And uh, he said, Chuck called Sam, how are you looking after yourself? How do you get away from it? How do you run one? Because actually, we've all been really taking care of each other. Uh, the uh, uh, funeral directors have been fantastic, they're left you laughs and so on, but it's been so important because they were going flat out. And so we talked about, in my case, I did a bit of writing and so on. And he surprised me, he said, could you write me into one of your books? So I said, are you sure about that? Because most people don't want to be in the book. And he said, I would really like it. It would be a great honour. So I said to him that uh, this uh, particular thing, I'm going to insist that we change your surname, though, because you need a little bit of privacy. So you can be Sam, but we're going to have a different surname. So I said to Shirley in the office, what are we going to call him? And she remembers the occasion. He'd be happy with me telling this story. Uh, remembers the occasion, and he's put his ashes in the ground, and he obviously put a little bit away, and as he went over, his trousers went <laughs> <laughs> So straight away, Shirley comes back, let's call him Mr. Ripley. <laughs> so he's getting written in as Sam Ripley. Now, surprised by that conversation, surprised by the care, so alongside certainty, there's always surprise. But just imagine if you took surprise out of it. Life would be so boring. Imagine you took certainty out of it, we have no anchors at all. Actually, certainty and surprise are exactly the right ingredients for a sense of adventure. So what does Jesus say to Peter? Forget about John. He's got his own particular link with my story. You follow me. Where am I? No, just follow me. It's an adventure. We don't know but you can trust me. So I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so there'll be times when we feel we need to be thinking about other people, and actually we just, before God, should be thinking about ourselves and our particular role. That's not being selfish or self-centred, it's having a love of self. Or sometimes the most difficult question to love is yourself. 
It actually then means your heart is full in order to be able to love other people. Of course, there are other times when we run out of steam and we need others to carry us. So it isn't a solo journey. So there are times when we should bear each other's burdens and there are times when we need to carry our own burden. And that dynamic is changing all the time. But whatever the real commission is, the adventure of following Christ. So whatever this new year brings, it's looking a lot, uh, going to be a lot better than this last year, let's follow Jesus in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.